the airliner that makes supersonic travel a reality. Sleek and graceful, flying twice the speed of sound, a symbol of prestige with a perfect safety record. But 113 people will perish in just 120 seconds. Now, using cutting-edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Europe. France. Paris. July 25, 2000. Charles de Gaulle Airport. 12.30 in the afternoon. 100 men, women and children check in for flight AF4590. They come from all over Germany and are expecting the trip of a lifetime. A dream holiday, costing at least £7,000 each. It starts with a supersonic flight on Concorde to New York. Then, a luxury cruise in the Caribbean. For Jörg Meyer's father, it's a special treat to celebrate his retirement. He had his 65th birthday in 2000, and he wanted this as a treat for himself and his partner. They both liked to travel, and it always had to be something a bit special. Concorde is a plane like no other, elegant, luxurious, and above all, super fast. Flying at more than 2,200 kilometers per hour, Concorde links North America to London or Paris in three and three quarter hours. Concorde's unique shape with a pencil thin cabin and vast delta wings enable her to race across the sky at three kilometers every six seconds. John Hutchinson has flown Concorde for 15 years. The best way of describing it is simply to say that it was a thoroughbred. It was a beautiful, responsive, powerful aeroplane. Like, I don't know, the Kentucky Derby winner, if you like. By 1.30, all of the passengers are checked in for their supersonic trip. The pilot, Captain Christian Marti, is already in the cockpit preparing for the flight. The holidaymakers are in good hands. 54-year-old Marti is one of Air France's most experienced pilots. An adventurer of extraordinary talents. In 1982, Christian Marti was the first Frenchman to windsurf across the Atlantic. He's a national celebrity. On board Concorde, Captain Marti runs through his pre-flight check. His air traffic controller is the experienced Gilles Logelin, who arrives to start his afternoon shift. I was on duty at the Southern Control Tower of Paris Airport, Charles de Gaulle. This particular day I was not supposed to work. One of my colleagues the, the day before asked me for a transfer of shift, so he did my morning shift and I did his afternoon shift. With the change of shift comes an unexpected bonus. Gilles Rogelin is now the controller responsible for Concorde's departure. The Concorde is one of the most beautiful planes I've ever seen. Uh, the, the line is pure. Uh, I really like to watch this plane landing, taking off. During his pre-flight check, Captain Marty learns that engine number two has a technical fault. A small part needs replacing. It isn't serious, but with Concorde, safety is always paramount. After 40,000 flights and 900,000 flying hours, there's never been a fatality. The repair delays Concorde's departure by one hour. 3.54. The passengers start to board. Among them are the Eich family, 
Christian and Andrea, and their two young children, Maximilian and Katerina. Klaus and Margaret Frensen are both school teachers who've saved for the trip for 20 years. Ordinary families off on an extraordinary adventure. At 4.35 in the afternoon, Concord is ready to depart. Anticipation on board mounts as the supersonic jet taxis to the runway. In the control tower, Gilles Logelin clears Air France flight 4590 for takeoff on runway 26 right. It's 4.40 in the afternoon. So far, for passengers and crew, everything is normal. Captain Marty lines up the plane at the start of the runway, ready to release the power of Concorde's four Rolls-Royce engines. For senior pilot John Hutchinson, a moment like this is always special. As you open the throttles up to full power, you feel this huge surge of power in the small of your back as the airplane accelerates down the runway and you just get the feeling that the one thing the airplane wants to do at that point is to get into the air as quickly as possible, into its natural environment. In the control tower, Gilles Logelin monitors the takeoff. I was watching the Concorde gaining a power on the runway because it was so nice to see that. It's a very heavy plane, so you know that the beginning is quite slow, and then you gain the speed. Concorde accelerates down the 4,000 meter runway. It passes through 320 kilometers per hour. Using computer graphics, we recreate what happens next. For Gilles Rogelin, it's a moment of sheer horror. Suddenly, I saw a flame just behind the body of the aircraft. So I jumped on my mic to say, Air France 4590, you have flames behind you. Captain Marty cannot see the flames, but accelerating through 328 kilometers per hour, Concorde is committed to the takeoff. There are only 2,000 meters of runway left, but Concorde needs 3,000 meters to have any chance of stopping safely. After the speed, whatever is the situation, the plane has to take off. He could not abort the takeoff. And as I was watching the, uh, the flames, I saw the nose of the Concorde lifting up. At 4.43 and 15 seconds, Captain Marty pulls on the control stick. Concorde takes to the air. This is how Concorde flight AF4590 appears to witnesses. Martin Bournet works in an office on the western edge of the airport. At 4.44, she sees a terrifying sight. I was looking out of my window and I saw Concorde taking off very slowly with the back of the plane on fire. I was really afraid. Because of the flames, I was convinced that the plane was going to explode right here in front of the office. The stricken airliner flies directly overhead. Close by where Martin works, courier Emmanuel Vermignon is driving his van past the end of the runway. When Concord went over, I had the window open and I was wearing a polo shirt. And I can tell you that the heat the plane was belching out melted parts of my shirt and gave me little blisters. I could really feel the heat on the ground. While Captain Marty struggles with the controls to gain altitude, out of his vision, flames engulf the left wing. The sickening sight is caught on camera by the wife of a truck driver. It is the only video footage ever captured showing Concorde on fire. It'll prove to be a vital link in the investigation.
this airport, a supersonic Concorde has just taken off. But now the plane is on fire and 109 people on board are facing peril. The next 69 seconds will be critical. 4.43 and 30 seconds. Concorde is struggling to remain in the air. It's only 30 meters off the ground and the crippled plane is on a collision course. The town of Gones and its 25,000 people lie directly in its path. Driving towards the petrol station she owns in Gones is Christine Turpin. I was returning home when I saw a plane. It was Concorde, with fire coming out of the back of it. I slowed down and slowed down, and I saw the plane in flames. Captain Marty is running out of options. Concorde's left wing is disintegrating. Businessman Patrick Tess is directly in the plane's path. I was in my office, talking to an agency. The window faces the runway, and I was interrupted by an incredible noise. It was Concorde. It was on fire, and it was listing violently. Concorde lurches to the left. The plane stalls and plunges to the ground. It's 4.45. It's the moment every air traffic controller dreads. Gilles Lagelin reaches for his mic. I've called the Air France and I said, Air France 4590, do you hear me? Air France 4590, me recevez-vous? I said it twice. Air France 4590, me recevez-vous? There was no answer. The supersonic jet, loaded with fuel and 109 people on board, crashes right on top of a hotel on the outskirts of Gonesse. A terrifying fireball tears through the building. British teacher Alice Brooking has just checked into a first floor room. So I went straight for the door of the room that I was in saw all the flames, saw there was no way out via the stairs. I leapt across the room, leapt across the bed to the window. Saw, luckily, that the receptionist was already down in the car park underneath me, and he just said, you have to jump. At the same time, Christine Turpin also witnesses the explosion and fears the worst. It fell, and from where I was, I thought it had landed on the gas station. And I thought, because my daughter and the girl who works for me were there, that they were all dead. As Christine Turpin drives in, a passenger armrest falls onto the petrol station. It's a chilling reminder for Christine of the fate of the passengers. When you saw the armrest, you couldn't help but imagine what it must have been like for the people on board the plane. Within eight minutes of the crash, dozens of fire engines and ambulances race to the scene. An appalling tragedy, not just for those on Concorde, but for those in the hotel. Regional Fire Chief Colonel Fabrice Chauvin leads the rescue. 
Whilst driving, there were many things going through my mind. The important thing for me was to divide the operation into two separate parts. One, the aircraft crash, extinguishing the fire and the rescue of any survivors. And two, organizing treatment for the wounded before they're evacuated to hospital. The intensity of the fire is so great that it'll take three hours to bring it under control. As these TV news images show, the charred remains of the airliner and the hotel are unrecognizable. The rescue attempts are futile. 113 people die, four from the hotel and 109 passengers and crew in Concord. Three generations of the Eich family are wiped out. The children's grandparents had wanted to treat the family to a holiday of a lifetime and had booked the Concorde flight. School teachers Klaus and Margaret Frensen had saved for 20 years to fly on Concorde. Rescuers begin the gruesome task of pulling the bodies from the crash site. One of the hotel workers to die is a 19-year-old student, Kenza Rashid. She joined the staff of the Hotelissimo only the day before the crash to earn some holiday money. Another victim is chambermaid Devrani Chandang Singh. She dies leaving behind her two children. Most of the bodies are burned beyond recognition and the forensic pathologists can only identify victims by their dental records. It's a harrowing time for the victim's relatives, like Jörg Meyer. One of the more difficult things was the identification of my father and his partner. One has to say, nothing much remains of the passengers after an air crash. That was difficult. Jörg will have to wait two weeks before pathologists identify the remains of his father. That's how long we had to wait. You can imagine that that's not exactly easy, day after day. The crash takes everyone by surprise. Concorde, the queen of the skies. The plane that makes supersonic travel a reality. People's dreams come true. Had never had a fatal accident until this moment. It takes just 120 seconds to shatter that perfect record. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened. Cutting-edge computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. The French Bureau of Air Accidents send their top investigators. Using their data, we can now piece together the deadly chain of events to find out what really caused this terrible tragedy. As the investigation begins, nothing is off limits. Did pilot Captain Marty make a fatal error? Or was there a fault hidden within the perfect plane? Investigators make routine checks of the passenger and luggage lists. Immediately, they find something suspicious. 19 pieces of luggage that according to the loading report should not have been on the plane. They don't belong to the passengers on flight AF 4590. Could a terrorist have smuggled a bomb onto the plane? It wouldn't be the first time. 270 people died in 1988 when terrorists planted a bomb in the luggage that destroyed a Pan Am 747 in the infamous Lockerbie incident. At Gonesse, investigators divide the Concorde crash site into a grid in order to make a meticulous search. They photograph and tag everything found in each section.
It's a painstaking process, which takes four weeks. Then, every bit of wreckage is taken away for identification and analysis. Three hangars at Le Bourget, another Paris airport, become their final resting place. This pile of debris is all that remains of the hotel. Such is the intensity of the crash and fire that a 40-room building is reduced to little more than a pile of rubble. And this is what remains of Concord. One of the world's finest examples of modern engineering is now just a tangled heap of charred rubber, aluminium, melted plastic, and fractured hydraulics. The French investigators separate and identify every fragment. Among these burned remains lie the crucial clues to the cause of Concorde's crash. Within hours, the French Bureau of Air Accidents team recover the black boxes. These devices are carried on all airliners to record important technical data and, crucially, the pilot's conversation from the cockpit. They analyze the black boxes. They hear no sound of an explosion. It's clear to them terrorism is not to blame. The investigators are forced to look for a new lead. They focus on the last minute engine repair Captain Marty orders just before takeoff. They know Concorde returned from New York the previous day with a faulty thrust reverser on engine number two. Thrust reversers help to slow the planes down after they've landed. Investigators analyze the flight data recorder closely, but find no evidence that a faulty thrust reverser could cause the accident. The pressure to find an answer increases. Until they do, the French authorities ground all Air France Concorde flights. The spotlight is now on the 120 seconds from the start of Concorde's final takeoff. Captain John Hutchinson has flown hundreds of Concorde takeoffs. Now, once you've lined up on the runway, the captain will then punch on the stopwatch and open the throttles fully. The captain's job is to keep straight down the runway. The co-pilot's job is to do the speed calls. And the flight engineer is sitting there and he's monitoring all the instruments. In particular, this bank of instruments here, which are the engine instruments. Data from the black boxes makes it clear that everything is normal until Concorde reaches 323 kilometers per hour. Concorde is now only 79 seconds from disaster. Data recorders reveal a sudden loss of power in both engines under the left wing. Immediately, the black box picks up the dramatic warning from the control tower. Air France 4590, you have the planes behind you. Despite the warning, pilot Christian Marty has passed the point of no return. There's not enough tarmac to stop safely. He has to take off. He pulled back on the control column to rotate the airplane up to its nose-up angle of 12.9 degrees. And he was having problems with the left-hand engines, not producing the power they should have. And he would have been working very hard, trying to control the airplane, trying to get speed. But of course, he was being overwhelmed by the, these problems uh, on the left-hand engines. The engines become the new focus of the investigation. Why did they lose power at such a critical time? Just two minutes into its journey, Air France Concorde flight AF4590 crashes, killing 113 people. A devastating blow to the world's first supersonic airliner. 
Using advanced computer graphics based on the official report, we go deep into the investigation to unravel the deadly chain of events. Investigators know that two left engines lose power as Concorde passes 323 kilometers per hour on the runway. But why? Then, an important new clue. The French investigators find several fragments of tire on the runway. One of them weighs four and a half kilograms. Tests quickly confirm they belong to Concorde. It's a significant lead. Why? Because Concorde's tires inflate to extremely high pressures, which make them more likely to burst than other aircraft, especially during takeoff and landing. Pilot John Hutchinson explains. And in fact, when the captain pulls back to rotate, he's actually compressing the undercarriage into the runway, so there's even more stress on the tires and the wheels at that particular point. This additional pressure makes Concorde's tires even more vulnerable. Now they're onto something. The French accident investigators go back through the records and discover that for Concorde, tire blowouts are far from rare. They identify over 50 cases of tire burst on takeoff and landing over 24 years. One of the worst incidents involved another Air France Concorde, this time at Washington's Dulles Airport in 1979. Bill Lightfoot was a passenger on Concorde that day. I could see a, a big ragged hole in the wing with like pieces of aluminum or a metallic alloy and a lot of liquid pouring out of, that, uh, of the hole that had been ripped in the wing. The official report into this accident found that the tire burst during taxiing. Then the exposed metal wheel got very hot and exploded just before takeoff. The plane took off, but 20 minutes later returned safely to the ground. The plane survived this scare, but it caused a major overhaul of tire safety. Concorde engineers installed sensors to detect underinflated tires, modified inspection procedures for wheels before every flight, and most importantly, as aviation expert David Learmont explains, developed stronger tires that can carry twice their normal load. The requirement was that in test flights, you should be able to have a complete tire blowout during the takeoff run, and that you should be able to complete the takeoff with no tires left. And that is what the wheels um, subsequently were, and never again did a wheel fail. That is, until 18 years later in Paris, when something goes very wrong. Despite all the safety measures, one of Concorde's tires explodes in fragments. Investigators dig deeper. They re-examine all the debris found on the runway and then make the most important discovery of the investigation. This 43 centimeter mystery strip of metal. When you match the 43 centimeter strip of metal to the damage on Concorde's tire, it's a perfect fit. Suddenly, the whole inquiry now depends on the source of this metal. Where did it come from? It takes five weeks of painstaking detective work, comparing it to the thousands of parts that make up aircraft. Then, a breakthrough. They discover the metal strip comes from the engine mounting of a DC-10. The flight log from Paris reveals a Continental Airlines DC-10 took off five minutes before Concorde. They track down the plane to Houston, Texas, and incredibly find the engine has a missing part. It's the metal strip fitted 16 days earlier during maintenance on the DC-10. 
When David Learmount first sees the photographs of the strip of metal, he's astonished. It had really rough edges, and this was not just rough edges because Concord had run over it. It had been cut roughly. The edges were not straight, not even when it was made. The other thing is that it had holes drilled in it for putting screws or rivets through, and these were all over the place. Investigators now have a very strong theory about how the strip of metal contributed to the crash. 81 seconds before the crash, Concorde AF 4590 is traveling at 323 kilometers per hour down the runway. The tire hits the metal strip. The tire explodes and a massive four and a half kilogram chunk of rubber from the tire flies at high speed up into the wing. But Concorde's fuel tanks are in the wings and the delta-shaped wing is not designed to withstand such an impact. This sort of eventuality had never been foreseen in trials. It was estimated in all the trials for certificating the aircraft in the first place that if a tire exploded, the pieces of tire that would actually come away from the wheel would be about one kilogram in weight. The chunk of rubber that hits Concorde's wing that day weighs nearly five times as much, four and a half kilograms. No one had planned for that sort of impact. What's more, you can match the large rubber fragment of the tire with a dent on the wing. But surprisingly, the wing is not punctured at that point. So, if the heavy chunk of rubber hadn't punctured the wing, what made the fuel leak out? The piece of tar which actually hit the wing and did the damage was so big and so flat that although it was so heavy, it didn't go through the wing at all. And it caused such a shock wave to go through the fuel that it actually blew a plug of wing tank skin outwards. The shock was that bad. When the rubber chunk hits the wing, it sets off a pressure wave which finds the weakest joint in the fuel tank. The fuel bursts out of the tank. 75 liters of fuel pour into the engine every second. But even fuel gushing over the engine needs a spark to ignite. Where did the spark come from? Air France Concorde AF4590 crashes after takeoff from Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. Our graphics can simulate a virtual camera on the runway to reveal the cause of the accident. As the plane hurtles down the runway, a rogue strip of metal bursts a tire. 81 seconds before the crash, a heavy chunk of rubber flies into the fuel tanks. Fuel cascades over the engines. Not enough on its own to cause a catastrophe, it needs a spark. From the cockpit voice recorder, we know that the pilots have trouble with the landing gear on takeoff. As Concorde struggles into the air, pilot Christian Marty calls for the undercarriage to be raised. But it stays locked open. The only video footage ever taken of the doomed flight provides further evidence. It shows the undercarriage in the down position. What stopped the wheels from retracting? The most likely explanation can be seen in this computer simulation. Shrapnel from the burst tire flies up into the landing gear bay, where it severs power cables. The undercarriage is now stuck in the down position. 
Worse still, the exposed wires are whipping around in the gale force airflow. If the exposed wires make contact, they'll spark. As fate would have it, they do. That contact ignites the leaking fuel. And at that moment, Concorde becomes a flying bomb. We can now tell you what it must have been like for Captain Marty in the cockpit. From the pilot's seat, he can't see the flames. All he knows is that Concorde is losing power in engine number two just at the moment of takeoff. One second later, the control tower alerts him to the fire. Air France 4590, you have flames behind you. Computer graphics show how Concorde would have looked. Now to make matters even worse for Captain Marty, the number one engine is losing power as well. Events are conspiring against him. Aviation safety expert David Learmount explains why. There was a fantastic gush of fuel out of this quite large hole, was literally drowning out that engine, which gradually lost power and finally went out. So the pilots were left with two engines when they're normally accustomed to having four. It couldn't happen at a worse time. Captain Marty needs maximum power, and there's not enough runway left to stop. He wrestles Concorde into the air. Cockpit voice recordings reveal that at 4.43 and 22 seconds, the engine fire alarm sounds. And three seconds later, the captain shuts down engine number two. The drill for a fire warning is that you shut the engine down and cut off the supply of fuel to it to try and, and then fire the fire extinguisher for that engine to try and put the fire out. Concorde is now 53 seconds from disaster. Gilles Rogelin in the control tower gives what help he can to Captain Marty. Do as you wish, you have priority to return to the field. But at 60 meters, Concorde is too low to turn around. So instead, Captain Marty tries to fly the crippled plane to the nearest runway at Le Bourget Airport, just five kilometers ahead. But there's a new problem for Captain Marty. The fire is now so intense that Concorde's wing is melting and disintegrating. At the rear end of the, of the wing on Concorde are the controls known as elevons, which enable the pilot to point the aircraft's nose up or down. The fire was so fierce that the rear structure of the aircraft was being virtually evaporated. The pilot's essential controls were being destroyed. At the same time, the toilet smoke alarms are heard on the voice recorders. For the passengers, fumes in the cabin make conditions unbearable. Concorde is now 49 seconds from disaster. In the cockpit, Christian Marti battles with the controls, trying to gain speed and height. But he's being overwhelmed by the fact that the wing and its controls are disintegrating. Thirty-three seconds. The engine fire alarm sounds again and remains on for the duration of the flight. Captain Marty runs out of options. Even the runway at Le Bourget, now only three kilometers away, is out of reach. With just 11 seconds left, the control tower hears Christian Marty's final words. Too late. No time. Four seconds left. The plane dips below 15 meters. The final sort of act was the airplane reared up and heeled over into about 110 degrees of bank. So the airplane at that point became completely uncontrollable. Three seconds. Concorde could no longer hang in the air. 
It stalls and begins to roll leftwards. A hotel lies directly beneath. The plane is about to come down. Just 118 seconds after Concorde begins accelerating down the runway, 109 people are staring death in the face. Two seconds later, Concorde crashes into an airport hotel. All 100 passengers and nine crew on board are killed, as well as four people in the hotel. Air traffic controller Gilles Logelin started Concorde on its fateful flight, and he is a witness to those terrifying final seconds. I knew that everything was finished. I knew that, uh, the, that it was the confirmation of a reality that I, I didn't accept, in fact. And uh, because until this moment, I, I still, I think, I still had the, the belief that uh, it was not true, that it was not the reality. So it gave me the, the point, I think. It gave me the, the, the reality that it was over, that this, that's what could not happen has happened, that it was a real crash. Concorde, the world's only successful supersonic airliner, has its perfect 25-year safety record destroyed in just 120 seconds. It's a crash of unimaginable horror. The passengers had only a few seconds to prepare for death. Lawyer Christoph Wellens speaks for the victims. I think the passengers realized early on that something was wrong with the aircraft. The plane didn't climb. Then a wing caught fire. It flew at low altitude just above the ground. Then the plane started turning over. I think the passengers knew very early on that something terrible was about to happen and that they must have been preparing to die. Two days later, relatives are allowed to lay flowers at the crash site. Even today, they feel a deep sense of loss. Jörg Meyer's father died in the crash. I certainly miss him. He leaves a gap for me that cannot be filled. What makes it more terrible is the fact that he didn't die from a natural illness, but in a horrific accident. And he was plucked out of life in his prime. The disaster was also traumatic for those who survived from the town of Gunness. Businessman Patrick Tess had a miraculous escape. He works directly next door to the hotel destroyed by Concord. To this day, he's haunted by the events. Well, of course the crash had an effect on me. You can't remain unaffected by it. See what I saw, the bodies, the fire, the injuries, it's awful. The smell of burning flesh is just terrible. For Concord, the Paris disaster is the beginning of the end. Three weeks after the crash, all Concorde flights are grounded. Air France and British Airways, the two airlines that fly Concorde, have to make major safety modifications. Tires are strengthened so that they remain functional even when punctured by a 30 centimeter blade. Engineers encase the fuel tanks with bulletproof Kevlar liners to resist puncture. And electrical harnesses in the main landing gear bays are reinforced. The 
but Concord was never to regain her former glory. 14 months after the crash, Concord passenger flights resume, but the cost of maintaining and upgrading the aging fleet is too great. Passenger numbers decline sharply. On the 24th of October 2003, Concord carries passengers for the last time. The first era of supersonic passenger travel is at an end. Concord is now just a museum relic. That fateful July afternoon in Paris is due to a critical chain of events. A rogue strip of metal on the runway punctures a tire, propelling part of the wheel into the wing. A pressure wave causes fuel to erupt from the tank and debris to fly into the undercarriage where it severs an electrical wire. A spark ignites, triggering an inferno at the point of takeoff, a crucial time. From then on, Concord is doomed. A chain of events no one could have predicted that ultimately brings about its destruction.